Welcome back to JDM Legends presented by Turn 14 Distribution. Today is D-Day, and by that I mean we are headed to the dyno. That's right, everybody. It is finally time to take this thing to the dyno. It feels like uh, it's been months. It probably has been months. We've been hit with a couple of delays. We are, however, going to be using a two-wheel drive dyno. And to do that, the same dyno that Dave's car was on, because I think it'll be a good comparison for, for sure. power figures. Um, but to do that, we do need to do one little mod to this car. So let's get this thing up in the air, and I'll show you what we need to do. So for this car to be put into two wheel drive mode, it is not like the 32s. And you guys can correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, but with the R32, all you have to do is pull a fuse and it switches over into a two wheel drive car. Uh, with this one, you have to pull this center shaft here. There's no actual way to do it without it. So uh, it shouldn't be too difficult here. I think, I don't know, and I'm not sure. I don't think there's gonna be a ton of any fluid that comes out of here because I, I don't think we're the first people to do this. All right, let's see what happens here. Look at that. That was pretty easy. Yeah. Less than 10 minutes work. Uh, and judging by the stub here, it does not look like any fluid is gonna leak out of here. What we still do have a problem with, and I mentioned this in a previous episode a long time ago, was there is oil pooling on the bottom of the oil pan. And let me tell you, I have looked everywhere at this point. You can see if I run my hand here, take my glove off, my hand's dry. If I run my hand around here, okay, above the line where the leak is, it is all dry. Like there's, it's, it's not coming from anywhere above the oil pan. So I have concluded that I must have some type of micro crack or fracture in hole something yeah. something yeah. in this cast pan that is causing it to weep just enough that it builds up because if i wipe this clean it takes like two days for this to happen so it's not like it's a huge leak if i look anywhere above the pan like at first i thought it was coming from this area here but it's all dry here so like right here you can see it's all dry so <laughs> it's just gonna live like this for now because otherwise I'm pretty sure I'd have to drop the pan and figure out what to do with it. So uh, an unfortunate turn of events, but whatever, it is what it is. Another small little item that I do need to take care of here is the belts are a little bit loose. They've been squealing, so I am gonna tighten them up. But I would like to point out, DP, that um, you see this massive complicated twin turbo mess with coolant lines and oil lines? There's no leakage from it which is a pretty proud moment because uh, I was so paranoid and worried. I thought for 100% sure there was gonna be a leak of sorts, but we did our due diligence. We did our pressure test before uh, installing this engine and it worked out. And would you look at that? Like we have not had any oil leaks from this, which to me is you know a modern miracle to a certain extent. Imagine if we did have a leak and how much work it would be to find well, it under there. That's, that's what I mean, man. Like it would just... Which raises would... the question, PT. Why did you not go single turbo and just make our lives easier? In, in hindsight, I, I probably, if I had to do it again, I would go single. Um, but the purity of this and uh, the sound, I think, is, is certainly worth it. So we're gonna find out what it makes for power. And then really, I think that's gonna be the indicator whether these turbos are too laggy or they spool up pretty quickly. So uh, without further ado, let's just cut to the dyno time here. And we have arrived at BMS tuning. The GPR is on the dyno. This looks awesome. I'm, I'm kind of pumped, but I'm not as nervous as I feel I should be DP because after all the work, all the time and effort, you'd think I'd have more nerves, but I, I feel confident that this motor is gonna run well. It's gonna make decent power. And uh, we've got Radic at RS tuning that's gonna jump behind uh, the wheel or the passenger seat, and we're gonna start getting to it here. One thing I forgot to mention is this car is obviously in two-wheel drive mode. You guys saw us pull the, the front drive shaft, but you were saying it's not actually going to make any real difference in power? No, the rear wheel, uh, sorry, the Skyline is 100% rear wheel drive all the time. The only okay. time it transfers to the front is during slip, right? Okay. So really, you're not gonna see a, a big difference there. I personally haven't seen a giant one, maybe like 5% when it is running four wheels. Right. So. And in, in, in this setup, it's actually 
you know, less stress on the system and so forth. And there is no damage being done. But mind you, uh, we do have to let people know, 33s and 34s, you do have to remove the prop shaft. From, yes. From the transfer yes. case to the front yes. differential. There's preload on the clutches. You will ruin them if you just unplug the um, uh, fuse for the pump itself. 32s, you could just unplug yeah. and, yeah. and go yeah. for itself. setup my goodness we just made 455 wheel horsepower and 312 foot pounds of torque at 15 psi that uh, to me is already at the number i was hoping we'd just make 450 at the wheel and radix said we're just getting started per se he says everything's running good we've got a real healthy motor um for the record these are 2860 uh garrett Gen 2 turbos. Uh, we have Tomei pond cams in there, a 264 uh, degree profile, and everything else. That we've got the full Tomei titanium exhaust system. Um, you know, Grady front mount. All is is essentially bolt-on stuff. So um, this, to me, is a very very healthy number for a motor that we don't know the condition of. Everything seems to be running good. So I am happy so far. Um, as I said, so we kind of like made the number that I was looking for. So right now we're going to put another uh, 3 PSI into it. So just around 18 PSI just to see what this thing will do. Uh, it could easily make over 500 wheel if we, you know, boosted it to 20 PSI or, or even further, which this setup is capable of, but we do have a fully stock engine. So we did not put a head gasket in, we did not put head studs in it. So we don't want to risk mucking about with it. So we're just gonna, you know, do kind of a, a hero run here, see what it does. was a what 17 and a half psi yeah. run yeah. so you can see there it made 480 and 338 yeah. foot pounds of torque it's impressive like this thing would make 500 yeah. at 20 20 pounds 20 pounds yeah, yeah. Pounds do it, yeah. so um i am going to run this at this 454 figure just because it's the way to go stock uh head gasket stock yeah. head studs yeah. you know yeah. especially you, going to the racetrack yeah. it makes no sense yeah. this extra 30 wheel is just going to stress yeah. the motor you could, you could you could flog on this all day and nothing will happen no. well we're, we're going to do exactly that so uh, <laughs> um i'm sure a bunch of people are going to have a, a the question of why you know these motors do ramp in late you can kind of see like let's say the turbos kind of come on at around 5,000 rpm ish right yeah so this is what a torque curve for an RB looks like. Yeah, yeah. Uh, specifically with uh, like a medium-sized camshaft. Yes. Right. Um, and a turbocharger that's not being boosted. Like right now we're running gate pressure, so we're not even using the. Sorry, like on the lower number here, right? Um, we're not using the boost control to bring it up early, right? And we're just leaving it that way because it's very conservative. But we could definitely bring it up faster. Yeah. Right. That wouldn't be an issue. 
um, but really it's what you want, right? We could play with cam timing, you know, move it over a little bit, play with it. There's so many things you can do, but yeah. you know. It's, but this is, this yeah. is really, we're not gonna gain a ton of no. area here. No, no. So it's just a matter of like small incremental changes sure. here, yeah. but. And like we talked, the RB is an understroked engine, right? So it's made to rev, 8,000 RPM is its home, right? Yeah. Um, so it, it wasn't designed to bring torque in faster here. And you're on the track, you're over 5,000 RPM. Yeah. You're, you know. You're using this, this area. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, it, yeah. Right? We were saying that on the tack, yeah. any like one to three thousand RPM yeah, yeah, is yeah. condensed because they don't even want you there. Yeah, You're not no. supposed to be there. So this is <laughs> a motor that you rev. So yeah. well, thank you so much. Yeah. This was uh, you know very impressive for me. I, yeah. I I just had weird expectations. I didn't know what I was coming into thinking f what we were going to make for power, and this is exactly what I wanted. So. Thank you, Radek. You are Thank the you. GTR tuner. Thank you. So Thank if you. anybody's looking for you know GTR tuning, check out RS Tuning. Thank and uh, thank you to BMS as always. These guys here. Anytime we need dyno time, they are here to help us. <laughs> oh man, it sounds rowdy. Oof. Wow, it sounds rowdy. It's so loud, isn't it? It's got such a different character than the 2J. It really feels like a, you know, a smaller high revving engine, which is exactly what it is, but it feels so different. I love the noise it makes though. It sounds good. It is, it's, it's, it's almost like it's not turbocharged. It's very progressive. Yeah. So you need to use the RPM. Basically the top half of the rev range is where this motor is going to be happiest. And oh, there, oh, goes, the there goes our camera. We go. Camera just mounted a little differently. It should hopefully stay yeah, where it needs yeah. to. But what were we talking about, DP? Before uh, the, the camera really the linear power band. The power that's right. You yeah. Use the top end. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Which is fun. It's like a Honda. It, it comes on quick. It does come on good. Yeah. Like. It, like we were worried this thing was gonna be laggy, but that doesn't feel yeah, laggy at I, all. I think the, the 411 gears help tremendously, mm -hmm. like really tremendously. And you know, that these turbos spool surprisingly quick. Like, look at that, man, man. Wow. Yeah. It just, uh, this thing likes to party, man. It, it certainly does like to party. You I, just gotta keep the revs up on this thing and it moves, man. I, I, I thought I was gonna be a little underwhelmed by it versus the Supra. But it feels really spicy. And it doesn't feel like a big heavy car in here because you've got like the low dash, you know, it's got that 90s compactness to it. It feels like it's gonna be a lot of fun to rip. It really does. It, it, I like, the more I drive this car, the more I fall in love with it. I get why they're special. I yeah. get why people like them so much. Like it's just, it, it really is truly a special it, car. It is, and it's like a brand new car in here too. Like, yeah. I know we're supposed to be talking about driving impressions, but just getting in this car, it's like you're in a time capsule. This thing is phenomenally clean in here. Yeah, no, it really is. The uh, the thing I will say is like, you know, under 3000 RPM, like you can see down here, this thing does feel like sure. a bit of a, like you really need to get sure. into it to get it to move. Yeah. But man, after that, it's uh, it just like, look at that, it just comes on. Yeah. The exhaust is not quiet, but it sounds crisp and like aggressive. It's too loud for street use. It's way too loud. I've I've kind of, you know, told myself, oh, there's a police officer right there. So we're going to have to go very slowly. That's hilarious. What are the chances of that? Yeah. Good eyes. <laughs> um, the thing is, it's it's one of those things. It's just it's too loud for the street at this point. I'm just, I'm gonna replace it with something a little bit more toned down mm -hmm. because of that kind of situation where yeah, you know, you're yeah. constantly worried about cops. You, you know, I don't wanna be the D-bag that's yeah. ripping around. Like even at 3,000, 4,000 RPM, like this thing has presence. Yes, it a does. A lot, a lot of presence, right? Yeah. Like you gotta get this thing into that under 3,000 RPM right now it's where quiet it's kind of like, like quiet and, and manageable. I mean, there is so. a silencer for this, but even with that in, it's probably pretty. It actually, so I've, I, I, ironically, I drove it once with the silencer and it's super quiet. Yeah. The downside is you can't really rip on it right. at that point because it changes tuned. the tune yeah. Yeah. so much that it's uh, it's not the way to go. Yeah. So like driving to and from the track, uh, like this exhaust to me is, is perfect for track use. The RB does challenge the, the Jay-Z oh, for, sure for it does. sound, for sure. Right? Yeah, for sound and 
there's a crispness to it, especially at higher RPM. Yes. It's really feels special, like almost like a motorsports engine, the yeah. way it, it revs and sounds. So no, it. it, it uh, I'm it, a fan. It really, really does, man. And, and I'm surprised this thing feels really peppy. Like even in second gear, if we just romp on it here. Spin in the tires. Yeah, there we are. are in two-wheel drive mode, guys. Because yeah. uh, we're just driving this car right after the dyno to get our, our impressions on it. But uh, like, watch this. Oh, oh man, she's, she's skating. Man, it's. I could get used to that DB. Oh yeah, that is good stuff. <laughs> that is really good stuff. And it's such a good amount of power. Like that 450 wheel just makes this car. I'm sure you know with. with four-wheel drive it's just gonna be so manageable it yeah. feels nice like yeah. this to me is what you want a gtr at that power level you know like 600 700 wheel certainly sounds great but I, at that point i want a 2.8 stroker mm -hmm. with the v cam and everything yeah. and, I and think where do you use all that power the, this feels very usable it really does yeah no it really really does so, so you drive your 2jm3 a lot i mean yeah. this is a short taste but what do you think? What do you, uh, you know? It, they're two different cars, man. I think like for me, the uh, the M3 is just so good, more of a street car. And I think that's what the, the 2J is, is really shines is from a street car perspective. It has a displacement, the turbo comes on and the, the E46 M3 chassis for me is just so refined. It is a nice chassis. Um, that, be, that being said, if this was a left-hand drive car, I think I, I I would be taking this right. I'm just not used to this. It of kind course, of still yeah, feels a little with your left hand. Yeah, but um, it's it's just all good. Like I am super impressed with this car. But wait, here's a quick update on the Supra, and it's not a good one. You'd think of all the cars we have here, the Supra would be the last one to spring a major leak. But uh, as you can see, there is a gob of oil here. Um, and what you don't see was the massive puddle of oil that was underneath the vehicle. And that is from our oil cooler lines. Uh, I just realized that we have, so we use these banjo fittings here and you can see this one here has developed a bunch of play and is leaking. And that is likely because of the amount of pressure that this hose here is putting like diagonal pressure this way, sideways pressure, that's probably loaded up the O-ring in there and caused it to fail. Mm -hmm. um, and what we did is we, we contacted Vibrant, our, our buddy Aaron there, and we asked him, hey, is this a common failure on this? He, he said, no, not really. But he also said, you guys shouldn't be using these banjos for an oil cooler because they severely restrict the amount of oil going in and out of it. So let me pull this down and I'll try to explain it a little bit more. And here's our oil cooler off the car. And here is that banjo fitting. So as you can see, this lives on here as such. And you can see the amount of holes here. There's, so there are four holes and they're pretty decent size. But when you think about pushing oil through that versus through an orifice like this, the flow is just so much better and greater this way. And this isn't going to, you know, this isn't going to, for example, starve the engine of oil, nothing like as serious like that is gonna happen. It just reduces the efficiency of your oil cooler. And us wanting to use this car on the racetrack, this is the way to go. And I think, you know, these are fine for a street application if you're looking just for to, to boost and help cool the oil a little bit. But if you're gonna to go to the racetrack, this certainly is the type of fitting. And you can see it is taller for sure but not by like a crazy amount. So we should be able to make this work. Um, we did have a, a very, very tight clearance issue up top there, but I'm still confident with a little bit of fiddling, we'll, we'll get these guys in there. So there it is, our replacement 90 degree fittings. Those are gonna flow so much better. Now it's just a matter of getting this back up into here and uh, getting it situated in the right spot. I did look at this, prior to putting this back in, or uh, prior to putting those fittings on, and it is gonna fit up, which is really good. I was a little bit nervous it won't, but as you can see, this is gonna fit up quite nicely here. So it's just a matter of bolting this all up and we're gonna be ready to rock. That's right, everybody. We not only have one leak, we have two. This one coming from the V160 gearbox here. You can see a drop of oil right here. And uh, after further inspection, it is not coming from the rear mainsail. That is a commonly misdiagnosed 
uh, leak. What this is, the, the more common area and the one that we have leaking is the shift selector seal. So it's the rod that comes out of the gearbox. And that one is not easy to get to. Uh, it, I think we'll be able to do it without having to drop the exhaust or anything like that. Um, and you can see it's a tiny little seal. I just did a lot of reading on the, uh, the internet about this. And people say, don't remove the old one. They say simply slide on the new one. So check out this tiny little seal. As you can see, we did end up removing the drive shaft. This is the shift selector shaft here. And there is a pin right in here that I'm gonna try to push out like that. Now it's gonna be pretty difficult after that, man. This is just one of those situations where it's, uh, it's really, really difficult to try to do this in car, but let's see if I could pull the pin out. Yeah, see, I could slowly slide it out like that. Oh, I think I've got it. Oh, so close. The, so, so it's out, except now it's stuck on the, the tripod here, so I gotta pull it slowly out. Ooh, oh, ooh. Things are falling, things are falling, but that's okay, so. That is the rod we were looking to remove. And now, I don't know, you guys probably aren't gonna see in here, but that is where that seal is on the backside in there. So to punch that seal inwards, I actually had to go into the stash, found this piece of metal tubing, and then I had to machine it down a bit because it was too thick, believe it or not. So <laughs> there's a, quite a bit of work that went into it, but now, you can see I can just slide this over the shaft, put this in here, and now just tap this all the way in. That's probably enough there. Yeah, looks like there's enough room for me to slide the new one on. And you know, I know some of you are gonna think, oh, what, that's crazy, why would you leave the old one on there? And in this scenario, to try to remove that, as you can see, it's just, it would be really, really tricky. And there was almost a dozen threads where people have done it with the double seal method and it seems to work fine. So I think this is certainly the way to go if you're on the car. All right, there it goes. Slowly going in. So I'll just tappy tappy that thing back into its original spot there. Well, that is going to be officially a wrap on this episode. We won't know if the gearbox is leaking until we make it to the track, which is going to be the next episode. You are gonna see the GTR and the Supra at the racetrack battling it out. It is gonna be epic as long as nothing breaks, which, uh, you know, I'm not so sure, DP. I feel like the Supra it's just got me nervous inside. Come on, a little oil on the it floor just, uh, and nothing. This thing is bulletproof compared to that ticking time bomb uh, right over there. I don't think so, I don't think so. I actually think for the track, the GTR is the way to go. Uh, one last thing to know, guys, check out, we just got these in, and these are our JDM Legends shirts designed by our buddy JDM Ego and uh, they are really, really rad. I'm super happy how they kind of came out. They're an homage to like what, an, uh, like an 80s poster, yeah. 90s poster. It's like a, a rock from like poster? A, or yeah, or like a, a concert poster. Concert so poster, yeah. super cool, love I love it. them. Um, they are going to be listed up on the website as of right now. So if you guys are interested in purchasing one of them, go and jump onto our merch store and grab one. As always, thank you guys for watching. If you certainly enjoy this video, think about giving us a like and a subscribe. Those things do go a long way, believe it or not. I know you probably see tons of YouTubers say, hey, give me a like and a subscribe, but those things certainly do help the algorithm and help us grow. So uh, if, you, if you enjoy our content, certainly think about doing that. All right, we will see you guys in the next one. It is gonna be at the racetrack where the JDM legends are gonna do some serious battle.